bow your heads in a word of prayer. Lord, allow me to be a conduit for your truth this morning. Amen. I'd like to read a little bit of scripture from the book of John, the 20th chapter, verses 19 through 31. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and side. <clears throat> the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, called Didymus, was of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hands into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, <clears throat> you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. May the Lord add blessing to the reading of those words for this morning. A phone call came into the church office one day. And um, the secretary answered it. And the voice on the other end said, I want to talk to the big hog at the church. And she said, well, I beg your pardon. If you're speaking about the pastor, you must call him pastor. And the guy on the other end said, well, I was about to give you a $10,000 donation. She says, hold on a minute. I think Porky just walked in. So listen up, Porky's about to talk. A British pastor tells about the first time that he worked in India. He went to India on a mission crusade. And this was more than 20 years ago. And he was there for just three months. And he worked in lots of different uh, areas, in some urban areas like the big city of Delhi, and others very rural. And for one short time, he worked in a place with a group of other Christians that was basically just a clearing in the jungle. The mission consisted of a collection of wooden huts. They had little verandas. I guess that's a porch, a little veranda. And in the middle was a sandy area in the middle. Now, the first night that they were there, they were told to go to bed as soon as dusk came. Dusk came. And he asked why. He wished he hadn't asked that question because he was told that at dusk, when dusk is settling, dozens of cobras and other dangerous animals would come out of the jungle undergrowth and make their way through the clearing. He imagined that they were looking for food or whatever cobras do at night, you know what I mean? And they were told to make sure that they closed their windows tight and put plugs in their sinks to stop the, the spiders and the scorpions from coming in. Now he goes on to say that he didn't sleep a wink that night. Well, he had the windows closed. The sink was covered with towels. He had a towel underneath the door, and uh, he uh, had paper stuck in the door lock, and he had the lights on. He never turned the lights off. And he huddled in the middle of the bed. He was scared to death. And he said outside he could hear the, the life slithering past the door. He could hear them. 
And he said he never felt so anxious in all of his life. And he said that he absolutely felt absolute fear. Most of us would experience fear under those circumstances, I'm sure, he, like he did. But now, consider and imagine the disciples' predicament at this point in our scripture. It was Easter Sunday evening. Two days before, Jesus, their master, had been cruelly crucified, murdered, if you will. The disciples of Jesus were only beginning at this point to process this. The third day after the crucifixion, it's now just settling in a little bit. One of their number, Mary Magdalene, had gone to Jesus' tomb early in the morning and she found it empty. And she was wondering, where's the body? What happened here? So she ran to where Peter and John were staying and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they put him. We don't know where they've taken him. Now, obviously, this was very alarming news to anyone that loved Jesus. Why would somebody have taken the body? Where did they take the body? Peter and John ran to the tomb to see for themselves. And finding the tomb, just as Mary described it, Peter and John returned to their quarters. They didn't do anything. They just went back home, or wherever they were staying. So Mary was left alone at the tomb, where Jesus himself appeared to her and called her by name. And at first she didn't recognize him. When he spoke to her, and revealed himself to her, she just blurted out, Rabboni, which means teacher. He had been her teacher. Afterward, Mary Magdalene went back to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. And she told them that what he had said and all the things that he told her. Now, here is where we pick up the story again. Okay? That was before. Now we're here. It was evening. Now on the first Easter Sunday night. And the disciples were hovering nervously in the upper room. John's gospel says the doors were shut for fear of the Jews. How tragic it is anytime, anytime the doors of the church are shut because of fear. There was a time when many churches were never locked. Very few churches would risk that today. We fear that somebody would just sort of carry the church off lock, stock, and barrel if we left the doors open. But there were other doors that were shut in those golden days of old. For example, there were doors that were shut against people of other races. And how tragic it is when fear shuts the doors of a church. How tragic it is when fear shuts the door of a person's heart. That happens to people. It does. They draw into their selves it, it, it privately and hold everything in. Something out there is, is, is going to get them. They're too threatened to do anything. Just scared. Are you living behind a closed door today of some sort? Anybody? Because of some unfounded fear? Unfounded fear? One reason the disciples were hiding behind closed doors, may have been the increased number of rumors in Jerusalem at the time of Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. There was rumors rolling everywhere. John says that the disciples were behind closed doors because of fear of the Jews. Now there's no indication in the scriptures that such fears are justified. You don't read that anywhere here. There is no evidence that the terrible violence of that weekend 
went beyond the torture and the crucifixion of Jesus. They had got their guy. They murdered him. He was done. Everything's okay. But probably, you see, there were rumors. Rumors seem to always happen at times like this. Whenever there is a conflict, you see, between rival groups, rumors just fly. They're just everywhere. Rumors. Fear seems to escalate. Reason is suspended. There are a lot of fears in our society even today. You agree? Lots of fears. That fear is often fed by rumor. And of course, we have perfected the rumor mill of our time. Everybody's passing rumors. We, we got it down pat. We know how to, how to have a rumor, that's for sure. We have the news media to thank for this unparalleled access to misinformation. Even worse, we have social media, which feeds us a steady stream of hateful misinformation. Hateful misinformation. If the disciples had taken to heart the rumors that were circulating around Jerusalem about the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus, the Christian message would never have gotten off the ground. Satan would have won for sure. Thanks to this steadfastness of this small band of believers, the word got out. What was the word that got out? He is risen from the grave. And of course, it cost many of them their lives. One of those who gave their lives was a man named Thomas. Thomas was one of the twelve, and he was not with the other disciples on that Easter Sunday night when Jesus made his first post-resurrection appearance. So the other disciples were happy, and they said, We have seen the Lord. But he said, Unless I... See the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand in his side where the spear went. I'm not going to believe. No, no. Uh-uh. Not me. You know, <laughs> there's a little bit of Thomas in me. How about you? There are so many scam artists around today. Who can you believe? Remember, most of Thomas's friends were fishermen. And you know the tales that fishermen tell, right? Besides, common sense will tell you people don't rise from the grave except in vampire movies. Doesn't happen. Who would blame Thomas for his reluctance to believe? The Jew. In 2019, just before Easter, a magazine carried an article about a group of funeral directors in South Africa who were suing a TV preacher in their country who claims to have resurrected a man from the dead. Now, there's footage, they have footage of this Sunday service showing Pastor Alf Lucan shouting, Rise up! to a man in a coffin who promptly jerked straight up and sits straight up. And the worshipers there were just cheering and going crazy. Personally, I would have looked for the nearest exit. You see a man jerk up in the coffin, I'm looking for the door. I'm out. Obviously, it was a deception act. It was deceptive, of course. But one good thing came out of this thing. The video that they have went viral in South Africa on social media and has opened a national debate in that land over fake pastors. Pastor Lucan has done quite well for himself, though, through all of this. He, he's made out pretty good. He now charges congregants $360 to attend one of his services. Get your pocketbooks out. Because when he get, gets them in there at $360, he's 
he asked for more donations. According to this report, Lucan owns 12, a 12 passenger jet plane. He owns a Bentley, he owns a Ferrari, and he has many other luxury automobiles. Now the funeral directors suing Lucan say that they were, they were tricked into participating in his resurrection stunt. And they have suffered damage to their reputations. Well, duh. Religious faith is based on trust. But there will always be those twisted individuals who will try to take advantage of unsophisticated believers in order to live their, line their own pockets. They're everywhere. Turn your TV on. You'll see them. They're everywhere. At the same time, though, very little attention is paid to the hundreds of thousands of pastors who faithfully serve Christ every day, sometimes under the most difficult of circumstances. Thomas said, unless I see the nail marks in his hand. Thanks, Lord. We can appreciate his reluctance, can't we? We can. A week later, the disciples were together again. This time, Thomas was with them. And again, Jesus, with, unlocked, with locked doors, was there, stood among them. And once more, he said, peace be with you. Then he turned to Thomas. And he said, put your finger here in my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And Thomas just, I can envision him dropping to his knees and saying, my Lord and my God, he realized who he was at that point. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And folks, he's talking about us. We are not there. We didn't eyewitness anything but of the resurrection. But one of the reasons we believe is the testimony of people like Thomas, who, like the other disciples, gave his life for his belief in Christ's resurrection. Now, <clears throat> I started out a few minutes ago with a story about India. <clears throat> you know where Thomas' story ends? You know where Thomas died? He died in India of all places. He became the apostle to the people of India. He brought the gospel of Jesus Christ to a land that was so culturally different from northern Israel where he grew up. And it's said that Thomas died a, a martyr after he was run through with spears, five spears, by five different soldiers. That had to have been an excruciating death. Thomas said, my Lord and my God. And after his encounter with the risen Christ, he was no longer doubting Thomas. He was the apostle Thomas, willing to give his life to proclaim that Christ is alive and life is eternal. That's why we're here in this place today, because seeing through the eyes of followers like Thomas or ourselves, we also believe. Do you believe? What do you believe? Christ is risen. Back in the early 1900s, <clears throat> there was a young man, young farmer in South Carolina, and he did not believe in the existence of Europe. He didn't think it was there. He thought Europe was a fictional place. He didn't believe anything existed past the Atlantic Ocean. He just, there's nothing there on the other side. Nevertheless, in 1918, this farmer received his papers from Uncle Sam, who drafted him into the army and had the opportunity, he had the opportunity then to experience Europe as a matter of fact. He was sent there. When he got back, he said, You wouldn't believe what lies over. You wouldn't believe. 
And that's how we feel about life beyond the grave, is it not? You wouldn't believe what lies over there. We believe because men and women like this doubting Thomas gave their lives to get the word out. And what is the word they got out? Christ is alive. Amen? Amen. We live in the breath of God, not just here in this building, <clears throat> but everywhere we go because we are Christians. Sometimes we don't live the way we should. We need to correct that. But Jesus is always with us. He never leaves our side. And we need to continue to believe that and understand that and pass that on for those who are in need of that word. Pray with me, Lord. Lord God, we just thank you so much for this time we've had together. The time in your house is so precious. But there is so much time before we come back here. And it must be used for the glory of the kingdom. And for passing on the good news that Jesus Christ is alive. Until we meet again. Amen. <laughs>